In this lecture, we'll look at the structure of Matthew's Gospel and explore some of the views that have been suggested, including my own, for how to understand what Matthew is up to, what his purposes are, in the way in which he presents the story of Jesus. The first question we want to look at is, why do people look for a structure in Matthew's Gospel? And relatedly, why does Matthew have a certain structure to his Gospel? As we look at structure, we should note, first of all, that the four Gospels that we have in our Bibles have different structures to the telling of the same story, the story of Jesus. So the different Gospel writers have different purposes, and these purposes certainly overlap. One doesn't have only one purpose and another have another purpose, but rather they overlap and yet they fulfill those purposes in different ways. And we can get at that through paying attention to structure. It's easy to see that Matthew is a structured gospel. And yet um, it is true that people have offered very different understandings of what that structure is. The gospel of Mark, on the other hand, seems to be less structured if you just compare Matthew and Mark with one another. And in fact, uh, in the early second century, Papias was recorded as saying that Mark wrote down his gospel as Peter told stories about Jesus, which leaves the idea that the, there was no uh, intentional um, purpose in the structure itself in Mark's gospel. Now, what Papias is probably saying is that Mark hasn't messed with things, but that the source of what he uh, presents in his gospel comes from the apostle Peter, comes from a disciple, comes from an eyewitness. And that's probably his main emphasis. And if so, then that would leave some room to say, yet there is some kind of structuring in Mark's gospel. And if, as you study Mark's gospel, uh, which we're not doing in this course, you would see different ways in which contemporary scholars have suggested uh, Mark did structure certain parts of his gospel. Take, for example, Mark chapter 4, which uh, brings together a number of stories um, uh, of Jesus' teaching in parables, or the uh, fact that all four Gospels end with the passion of Jesus, uh, the death and resurrection. The climax of the story is that climax of the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so we can find certain structuring um, basic structuring, and sometimes perhaps some more specific structuring within a short place in a, in a gospel like Mark. Now, Luke, Luke actually says this uh, famously at the beginning of his first of two volumes. In Luke chapter 1, 1 through 4, he says, Since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us, and notice that language, orderly account, Verse 2, just as they were handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the Lord, so his sources are eyewitness sources, I too decided, after investigating everything carefully from the very first, and now he says it again, that he decided to write an orderly account, again, an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the truth concerning the things about which you have been instructed. So this idea of an orderly account is met, mentioned twice in the introduction to Luke's Gospel. But the question is, what is the order? Is it a chronological order? Is it a thematic order? Is it a narrative order? Um, is related to the idea of themes. Is it a theological kind of ordering? And you see, we, I have here on this slide... Um, the idea that the author may have had several purposes, an historical purpose. Luke, Luke wants to tell the story, the story that has been told by eyewitnesses. There's a strong historical purpose in this. But an orderly account could also have literary dimensions to it. 
And here's how you tell the story well from beginning to end. Uh, now, be, even uh, when we look at Luke and, and at Matthew, they decide that the beginning needs to be the very beginning in terms of Jesus' birth. Whereas Mark and John uh, start with Jesus' public ministry. So an orderly account uh, can be um, told with historical concerns or literary concerns. Now themes uh, could be, let's, let's group these kinds of teaching of Jesus. Let's take the parables, for example. But they can also be, let's take the parables of the kingdom. And that's actually what we find in Matthew 13, parables of the kingdom. Actually, I would argue parables of response to the kingdom are there. So there's a theological purpose as well. And then pedagogical purpose, a well-structured gospel can lend itself to teaching. And some have even talked in the past about a school of Matthew's community that produced Matthew's gospel. Now, I wouldn't suggest that that's a correct view, but the reason that view has been popular uh, or was popular in the mid-20th century was that Matthew seemed so well structured that it was a good gospel from which to teach. Structured in terms of sections like the Sermon on the Mount or the uh, missionary discourse or the uh, ecclesiastical discourse or the apocalyptic discourse. This just seemed ready for taking as a block of material that could then be unpacked in a teaching context in the church. So uh, these are different purposes that can relate to the idea of structure. Now, one thing to note finally about this is by paying attention to structure, we can also appreciate the fact that we have four canonical Gospels. The Gospels do tell the same story, but they don't say the same things. And even when they do tell the same story and have, a, have the same literary source um, to tell the story, they sometimes change things up a bit to make a specific point, just like any good author would. I'm telling you this story so that you get this point out of it. And so by paying attention to structure, we can appreciate, it's one of the ways in which we can appreciate having four Gospels in our canon of Scripture. One of the authors who's written a whole dissertation on the structure of Matthew's gospel, and there have been a number of scholars who've done this, is David Bauer. He teaches at Asbury Theological Seminary. And in 1989, in his dissertation, he suggested that we should look at six issues to uh, understand Matthew's structure. First, he says that we should pay attention to geography and chronology in the gospel. This may not give us an understanding of the key elements of the structure, but they are structural um, points that are made in the gospel. Where is Jesus at a certain point of time uh, when something is said, when something's done? And then chronology, when is this taking place in his ministry? And does it take place after something else or not? When M M Matthew makes a point of the geography or makes a point of chronology, what is he doing? Now, the second point refers to a formula that appears five times in the gospel. The formula is after Jesus finished saying these things. So, for example, the first one is in 728 at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, after Jesus finished saying these things. Or 11.1 which occurs after the um, missionary discourse in chapter 10, or at the end of the chapter on parables in chapter 13, verse 53, it occurs um, a section on uh, teaching on discipleship, sometimes called the ecclesiastical discourse in chapter 18, is followed by in chapter 19, verse 1, with the same formula after Jesus finished saying these things. And then after the Mount of Olives or the apocalyptic discourse, uh, as we move into the Passion narrative in chapter 26, 1, we find the formula again. 
The next slide is going to look at B.W. Bacon's theory that makes this the prominent way to structure Matthew's gospel. The third thing Bauer says we should look at is, he calls it a formula, I'm not sure it is, but it's repeated twice. It's in 417 and 1621. And this formula is from that, from this time, or from that time on. Um, and so does that create a major break in Matthew's gospel? For Bauer, it does. We'll see this later, where he suggests um, breaking up the gospel into three sections on the basis of this. And then in the fourth point, Bauer says the we should pay attention to the relevance and function of characteristic Matthean literary devices, such as chiasms, inclusio, numerical arrangements uh, for Matthew's macro structure. We'll look at a chiastic suggestion for the, a macro structure to Matthew's gospel um, later. The fifth point is the existence of discrete topical units within the gospel and their unity and interrelationships. Now, this is actually going to be my perspective on how to structure Matthew's gospel. Uh, clear topical units for pedagogical purposes that account for the unity and interrelationships of the gospel. And then the sixth point he sa says we should pay attention to is the implications of Matthew's structure for theology, especially Christology and salvation history. It's not just the structure of a narrative. It's not just historical structuring, but the structure gives us clues to reading Matthew's gospel theologically. And then um, the seventh point I have here is beyond Bauer's six points, and that is uh, we need to pay attention to Matthew's redaction of Mark's gospel, which we've already talked about, which gives us clues as to what Matthew is up to in um, the structuring of his gospel. So if Matthew moves a miracle story, moves a saying of Jesus, he's regrouping it for some reason. What does that tell us about what Matthew is doing in the structure of his gospel? So the first theory I wanted to mention is uh, one that always gets mentioned in discussions of structure of Matthew's gospel. It's an early theory, and it's the five books theory of B.W. Bacon, a very popular way of talking about the structure of Matthew's gospel. The formula saying when Jesus finished saying these things occurs five times, as I've already noted. And Bacon uh, says that what this gives us then is um, a way of looking at Matthew's gospel in terms of uh, narratives, followed by discourses, followed by narratives, followed by discourses, and so on. The after Jesus finished saying these things occurs after a discourse. And Bacon said that those discourses then, like the f formula, occur five times. So there are five discourses in Matthew's gospel. Now, um, Bacon went on to say that this number five is significant because it corresponds to the books of Moses. And what that suggests in turn is that what Matthew's up to with his structuring is presenting Jesus as a second Moses, a giver of a new law. So you can see several things are going on in Bacon's theory. Well, one question that arises then is, does Matthew present Jesus as a new Moses or even as a type of Moses? And let's say he does. Does he also present Jesus as, um, for example, uh, in continuity with Elijah and Elisha as prophets or um, as a new Davidic king. In other words, is it only Moses that f is uh, figuring if, if we do find Moses there? So Jesus presents um, a teaching on ethics or, or discipleship in the Sermon on the Mount, 
It's on the mount, right? So the law was given on a mountain to Moses. So is that a connection between Jesus and Moses? Or in the Mount of Transfiguration, who appears? Moses and Elijah with Jesus. So is Jesus being presented as a new Moses? Um, there could be some of that theme, but my question is, how major is it? Is it a major theme? Does it outshine other themes? Is it the key to the whole structure of Matthew's gospel? Or can we account for Matthew's structure in some other way? Moreover, and I think this is a rather important point, are there really five discourses in Matthew? Notice on this slide up above where we list the Olivet or eschatological discourse. That occurs in Matthew chapter 24 and 25. And so the formula is in 26.1, after when Jesus finished saying these things. But what appears in the chapter before Matthew 24? It's actually another speech of Jesus. Matthew 23 is where Jesus pronounces woes on the scribes and the Pharisees, the hypocrites. It's a judgment speech. And that's not listed. It's awkward to list it. You either have to include it with the speech of the Mount, on the Mount of Olives, or you have to say that there are at least six speeches in Matthew's Gospel. If you include it, you have to reckon for the fact that the audience changes, the location changes, and there's a brief narrative um, that uh, that accounts for the move from Jesus in Jerusalem proclaiming judgment in chapter 23 and then being on the Mount of Olives. He is pronouncing judgment still, but he's doing more than that because his audience is the disciples and his speech is to them and the significance of the judgment that will come um, on the temple. The judgment in Matthew 23 is not a judgment on the temple. It's a judgment on the scribes and the Pharisees. So it's a different kind of judgment as well. So I think that the five discourses theory of structuring Matthew's gospel is problematic. Moreover, as is often pointed out, um, the five section theory of uh, Matthew's gospel does not account for the first four and the last three chapters of the gospel. You have to say, well, that's something else. Um, and that then downplays the significance of the climactic piece of Matthew's gospel, the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And then we could also ask, um, are the discourses not worked into larger blocks of material? Uh, that is, are they self-standing or do they relate to some of the narratives under some theme, which is what I'm going to argue? And therefore, the discourses are inseparable from some of the narrative in Matthew's gospel. Now, that all uh, does not necessarily um, argue against the idea that Matthew presents Jesus as a new Moses or even that Jesus was presenting himself in that regard. But it does change the way in which we discuss that. And Bacon's theory has often been presented as a theory to respond to. And so we've had, since Bacon writing in, the 19, in 1930, we've had all kinds of approaches to try to redo him in one way or another. And I'm only going to mention a few as we go f forward from here. Now, this is Bauer's theory, and Bauer, David Bauer was a student of Jack Kingsbury at Union Theological Seminary in Richmond, Virginia, when he wrote his dissertation. So the two of them both are associated with this idea of a two pivotal points uh, theory for the structuring of Matthew's gospel. That formula, as we mentioned earlier, is the formula from that time Jesus began points where the narrative pivots. And uh, what is suggested is what pivots is not just the narrative, but something that's significant about the Christology, 
of Matthew's gospel. So the key is uh, for Matthew's presentation is Christology. Kingsbury, followed by Bauer, argues that this breaks down into an initial section for uh, chapter 1, 1 through 4, 16, that is focused on the person of Jesus, the Messiah. And then from 417, all the way up until chapter 16, verse 20, the, the end, end, ending with uh, Peter's confession of who Jesus is, is the proclamation of Jesus, the Messiah. And then starting in verse 21 of chapter 16, we have the passion of Jesus, the Messiah. Suffering, death, resurrection of Jesus the Messiah, as Kingsbury puts it. Well, I, I would suggest that this is not a robust enough uh, presentation of the um, purposes of structure in Matthew's gospel. Uh, not to argue wholly against it, but I just don't think it's the key. One of the important scholars in the mid 20th century um, in New Testament studies was W.D. Davies, a Welsh scholar who taught at Duke University, and one of his graduate students, Dale Allison. Now, well after that relationship of professor and student, they wrote a three-volume commentary that's quite significant in the International Critical Commentary series on Matthew's Gospel. Uh, while it's now dated, it's still a very significant resource for the study of Matthew's gospel. And Davies and Allison um, show, suggest that Matthew shows an interest in numerical structuring within gospel, the gospel subsections. So this isn't a macro structure issue. This is uh, a suggestion that as you read Matthew's gospel, pay attention to his groupings of stories, his groupings of examples, and so forth. So, for example, uh, the grouping using the number three. Uh, in Matthew 6, 1 through 18 is an example. Right in the Sermon on the Mount, we have three acts of piety. We have uh, fasting, we have almsgiving, and we have prayer. And then there are also groupings of seven. There are seven petitions in the Lord's Prayer. There are seven parables that are offered in the chapter that presents Jesus' teaching in parables, Matthew chapter 13. Now, in this case, by the way, Mark has a chapter on Jesus' parables too, and that's chapter 4 in Mark. So the one question you have to ask is, is Matthew getting his uh, structuring from Mark, or is it really something that Matthew's doing? As you compare Mark 4 to chapter 13 of Matthew, you can see that Matthew adds some parables that Mar Mark does not have. In, in the chapter on the woes to the scribes and Pharisees, chapter 23, there are seven woes. And uh, right at the beginning of the gospel, in the genealogy, Matthew particularly points out that the gene genealogy consists of three sections of seven generations each. So what is Matthew up to in all of this? Another approach to structure that you find whenever structure is discussed, um, not just with Matthew's gospel, is a chiastic approach. Some people just seem to latch on to the idea of structure uh, in terms of chiasm. They look for it. And uh, so several scholars have suggested a chiastic structure to Matthew's gospel. And one of them that I'd like to point out here is Peter Ellis in his book, Matthew, His Mind and His Message. Um, he suggests that the length of discourses are approximately equal. Sermon on the Mount and the Olivet Discourse, for example. Secondly, the content of the discourses are thematically related. Matthew 10 is on the mission of the apostles or the disciples. 
Matthew 18 on the authority of the apostles. And then he says that before Matthew 13, Jesus speaks to all Jews, but after Matthew 13, Jesus speaks to the disciples. And then fourthly, he suggests that uh, numbers are important for Matthew. And so in addition to the five major discourses, he, he accepts five major discourses, are two minor ones. And those would be in chapter 3, verses 8 through 12, John the Baptist, and in chapter 20, uh, verse, verse 18 and following. And um, he says that this then makes up seven, uh, sig seven discourses. Now, um, this seems to me to <laughs> raise some serious questions. But one of the questions I have with all the approaches to chiastic structures that look at a macro chiastic structure is um, whether or not people are able to word things in an abstract kind of way to make the chiasm fit. Now, you know, a chiasm means that the first and the last have some kind of relationship. The second and the second last have some kind of relationship. It all pivots around some center. So you have like an A, B, C, B, A structure. And for something like Matthew's gospel, it would be much more ornate than that. But if you make A equal something that's very general, then perhaps you can make it fit with the A at the end of the thing. And I think this happens regularly. I've noticed over the years that we do think um, chiastically. And yet I would suggest we do that in a much more narrow way, not in a macro way, but in a micro way. So if you hear a reporter ask someone they're interviewing two questions, inevitably, the person answering begins his or her answer by answering the second question that's asked and then moves on to the first one. It's just something that we do. And that A, B, B, A in that case is it just seems something the way in which our brains are wired. So I think chiasm works, but I am very uh, suspicious of macro chiastic structures. And one of the problems with macrochiastic structures is that uh, some other scholar who comes along will not agree with the macrochiastic structure that's been proposed, but offer another one. And so you end up with several ways in which people have done that. Joel Green proposes that the center of a chiastic structure for Matthew's gospel is in chapter 11. Paul Gechter, in his Literary Art in the Gospel of Matthew, suggests that the center is actually in Matthew 13, verses 53 to 58. Um, so uh, be suspicious of chiastic structures. Don't be sucked into the excitement of, my goodness, look at this, we've got a great very thematic, or not thematic, but very neat structuring, literary structuring with this. Ask some serious questions about whether that was, the, whether the, the categories that are suggested are really getting at what the material is about. And secondly, do you really think that Matthew sat down and wrote out a chiastic outline for, and then filled it out with uh, what he wrote in the gospel? Or is there some other better explanation of all of this? Uh, one uh, suggestion might be along these lines is that if Matthew is uh, telling a story, you, you just don't tell stories chiastically. Uh, you might present ideas teaching chiastically, and that's certainly the case of Matthew, but Matthew is also a story. And so the story moves on to a climactic end of the death and resurrection of Jesus. So how much does chiasm help you uh, 
to articulate that point. And so then we move on to this discussion of a narrative structure of Matthew. Since the early 1980s, uh, narrative has been in focus in biblical studies. Um, and one example of a narrative structure of Matthew's gospel is a focused study by John Paul Heil. He actually looks at the passion narrative, Matthew, six, Matthew 26, 27, and 28 in his book, The Death and Resurrection of Jesus. And he says that uh, one thing we might look at is foreshadowing in the gospel, the foreshadowing of Jesus' passion uh, earlier in the gospel, and then the climactic presentation of the passion of Jesus in those last chapters. The announcement that Jesus is the Christ in the infancy narratives foreshadows his ministry of healing and teaching, he suggests. And the opposition to Jesus by Jewish leaders earlier in the gospel foreshadows the passion narrative at the end of the gospel. Matt, um, Heil also presents uh, the idea that Matthew uses uh, three as a way of um, presenting his material, of, of choosing three things to say that are related to each other, and we'll note that next. So pay attention to more microstructural uh, issues in Matthew. We've already talked about this in terms of numbers. Uh, for example, the groupings of seven that Davies and Allison have mentioned. Uh, John Paul Heil says that in Matthew 26 to 28, we can look at the structuring in terms of three. So look at A, B, and C here. Um, take Matthew 26, 1 through 56 uh, as a group. Uh, then Matthew 26, 57 through 27, 54. And then 27, 55 through the end of the book of Matthew in 28, 20. So there's a threefold structure to the passion, resurrection of Jesus. And then within the first, for example, he says, um, note that you can divide this Matthew 26, 1 through 56 into three sections. And in the first section, you can divide it in terms of three sections. So without getting into the details here, some is presented here on the slide. The point is notice the technique of structuring the telling of the story in terms of the use of threes here. Now that would also go for the Sermon on the Mount. Um, look for uh, th three points made, seven points made. Uh, seven things said, three things said, and so forth. Just ask yourself the question of how is Matthew grouping things at the micro level? Now I'd like to look at my outline for Matthew's structure. Matthew's structure suggests the superimposing of narrative topical themes on Mark's structure. So my approach is read Matthew alongside Mark, ask where he's changing things. And then my suggestion is that what we find is that Matthew changes Mark so that he can present this gospel in terms of topics. So it's, it's a primarily a pedagogical purpose that Matthew has in his arrangement. Now the narrative is still there, the narrative of Mark, the narrative telling of the story of Jesus is still there, but the topical themes um, is what emerges as we compare Matthew to Mark. And I would further suggest that these all have to do with Jesus' mission of bringing the kingdom of heaven to the little ones of the world. Now, I've introduced the word Jesus' mission but what I want you to hear in that, not as a debate about is mission the right word to use, um, but rather a very general sense of the word mission. And I want you to hear that by using that word, I'm suggesting that um, 
what we have is a narratival presentation of the story. In other words, Matthew doesn't take Mark's gospel and in creating themes in the telling of the story, end up with a theology, even less a systematic theology, as if these are thematic topics and now I'm going to discuss this issue, now I want to discuss this issue, but rather he retains the narrative develop, um, element to it. And that means that the structure of Matthew's gospel is not static in terms of ideas and the articulation of ideas, theological ideas, but rather uh, it's dynamic. Um, it's, and that's what narrative is. Narrative is dynamic ver versus ideas being static. Uh, so uh, if the word mission bothers you, um, well, let me first of all challenge you to come up with a better word, but primarily here in that, the idea that it's the, N the telling of the story of Jesus as the one who brings the kingdom of heaven, um, that is the key thing. Now, I've added to the little ones of the world here in bold because I think this is a key part of it um, in the telling of the story of Jesus. He comes to the little ones of the world. He comes to the Outcasts, yes, he has disciples who are not recognized people for their scholarship or their being uh, disciples of rabbis. They're they're not wealthy. They're every everyone uh, is little in some way. Uh, even uh, the tax collectors and prostitutes. And so Jesus' mission is to bring the kingdom of heaven to the little ones of the world. Now, that's, that idea is also related to the idea that what really stands behind Matthew's gospel is a theology of a new um, exodus, the return of the exiles back to the reign of God. You know, in the, in the story of Israel, we have the Israel coming out of Egypt and being formed as God's people. But then after a time being exiled, the northern kingdom and then the southern kingdom, going into exile, and the prophets talking about the restoration from exile. And what we have in John the Baptist's and Jesus' ministry, and then the disciples' ministry, and then the church's ministry, is a return turn from exile ministry. And so um, the little ones, our theme is also related to the idea of exiles, people who have been taken out of their land, their possessions taken away, um, they're being reduced to sec second class citizens or, or less, even slaves. Uh, these people now are the ones who are going to receive the kingdom which they don't deserve, but God graciously gives to them. So this is the theological, the narrative, the topical uh, structuring that I find in Matthew's gospel. And I'll be presenting this shortly in terms of how we proceed through the chapters of Matthew's gospel along these lines. Matthew does this then by identifying the initiation of the mission, describing the mission, expositing on the responses to the mission, describing the mission as one to the little ones of the world, explaining the rejection of this mission by the great in the world, describing the end time of the mission with an emphasis on activity of the little ones in a hostile world, and finally describing the mission's conclusion through Jesus' death and resurrection and then therefore ongoing mission as he gives the great commission to his disciples. In terms of his literary structuring, then Matthew accomplishes this by using almost all of Mark's gospel, by shortening Mark, uh, 
if you compare a story in Mark to Matthew, almost always you find that Matthew tells it in a shorter space. He probably does that so that he can lengthen Mark by adding new material. So he also lengthens Mark through the addition of material from sources such as Q&M. And, um, and much of that material that he adds is teaching material compared to narrative material. And then he also uh, accomplishes his task by shaping Mark into more of a narrative of the life of Jesus. For example, he includes the infancy narratives at the beginning and he expands the passion narratives, especially the resurrection narrative at the end. And then uh, he also does this by shaping the narrative of Jesus into thematic sections. And now then we get to the issue of the structure of Matthew's gospel on this approach. So my view is that this is how we can divide Matthew's gospel. First of all, the beginning of Jesus' mission, 1.1 1, 1 through 4.16. Then secondly, Jesus' mission in word and deed um, in 4.17 through 9.35. Uh, this is a, a, a section that is indicated by Matthew's use of an inclusio at the beginning in four, uh, at the end of chapter four. The first thing he says in this section uh, has to do with the crowd needing ministry. And then uh, we have this repeated at the end of this whole section in 935. Um so the second section, 417 through 935, breaks down this way. There's an introduction, which involves calling of the first disciples. Then a statement that Jesus ministers in word and deed in 423 to 25. Then an expansion of this, where what Matthew presents is Jesus' ministry in word, which is the Sermon on the Mount in chapters 5, 6, and 7 followed by an expansion of the point that Jesus ministers also in deed, primarily in miracles. That would be in chapters 8 and 9. And then, as we said earlier, that there's this one verse that we can say is the conclusion to the section, but it repeats what was said in 423 to 25. So these are the first two sections of Matthew's Gospel. My suggestion, and this is somewhat unique to my way of looking at Matthew's gospel compared to other scholars, is that this central part of Matthew's gospel is a rather long section that can best be described in terms of responses. You see, having presented Jesus' ministry in word and deed from chapter 417 through 935, now we look at responses to what has happened. To, in Jesus' ministry. And so uh, in 936 through 1042, we have re responses to the disciples' ministry. Here in chapter 10, we have what is often called the ecclesiastical, I'm uh, sorry, the missionary discourse um, of Jesus. Uh, notice under point D here, Jesus' parables of response to the kingdom chapter 13. People often re refer to chapter 13 as the chapter where Jesus tells parables. But I would suggest that all of these parables are parables of response. These parables uh, have to do with the response people have to the kingdom. And so I think that response is the key word in all of these uh, sections. So we have the response, and, and then uh, in those two examples of referencing chapter 10 and chapter 13, notice that both of those are discourses in B.W. Bacon's approach. These would be discourses, but you see they're discourses that are subsections to a larger thematic structuring in Matthew's gospel, in this case the thematic uh, the theme of responses to Jesus' ministry of the kingdom. So then, 
we first one is response to disciples ministry then the response to john the baptist's and jesus past ministry then the response of the wise versus the babes the babies the disciples the little the people who are little then we have jesus parable uh, parables on the response to the kingdom, chapter 13. Then we have the responses of Herod and the crowd. Then we have responses of Pharisees and scribes and the Gentiles. And then we have the responses of the disciples, including Peter's confession of who Jesus is. So notice that, that there's a narrative bit here too, because that's a climactic moment in the gospel where Peter has an aha experience of who Jesus is, that he's the Messiah. Um, and then following that, we have the response of God at the Mount of Transfiguration. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And then we have the response of the disciples that they're weak in faith, which concludes the section of response. So one thing you might ask is, okay, is that really where we need to divide things or should we have gone with response but started a new section after Peter's confession, for example? So those are questions I want you to be asking um, as you look at the structure of Matthew's gospel. But on my view, then we move uh, to the last pericope at the end of chapter 17, which is unique in Matthew's gospel, and take that all the way through chapter 20, verse 28. And see, this is a section on the disciples' mission as little ones. So the key uh, term there for me is the little ones. Uh, the description of discipleship is littleness. And we'll look at that in another lecture. And then we move on to Jesus' mission uh, challenged by all Jerusalem as he enters into Jerusalem and meets every leading group within Judaism, and finally pronounces judgment on them in chapters 20, 29 through 23, 39, the last verse of the chapter. And then we have the Mount of Olives discourse, the apocalyptic discourse. Jesus teaches on end time and mission in 24, 1 through 25, 46. And then the completion of the mission in the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus, which uh, concludes with the great commission of the disciples to continue the mission in chapter 26, 1 through 20, verse 28. Now, having looked at this from an academic perspective, I think we might conclude with a few points about preaching and teaching from Matthew's gospel and the importance of structure, um, the structure of the story of Jesus. So we've noted that there are some specific themes. And if Matthew has intentionally organized his gospel thematically, then perhaps this offers us a way of preaching or teaching Matthew's gospel um, in the way in which Matthew intended it to be read. We might look at thematic presentations of Matthew's gospel. Uh, we often preach from a specific pericope. Let's read this story, this parable, this healing miracle. A specific per pericope. But why not uh, have a sermon uh, that looks at the structure of Matthew? Why has Matthew put that story in that particular place? It's a simple point of reading the text in context and trying to see what Matthew is doing in the structure. Often sermons from the Gospels are based on several Gospels brought together to make a point. Like the famous uh, seven sayings of Jesus from the cross. There's no one Gospel that presents seven sayings of Jesus from the cross. Not even Matthew with his interest in seven. So uh, if we do that, then we're sitting above the text and saying we're going to re rearrange things just as the Gospel writers rearrange things. But are we qualified or certified to do that? Or is our goal in preaching to present what the author of a canonical book was 
uh, intentionally doing. So rather preach the sayings of Jesus from the cross in Matthew's gospel or in John, but not your seven sayings of Jesus from the cross. The structure of Matthew suggests some topics for the church, the Sermon on the Mount, for example, or the miracles in the kingdom of heaven, for example, in chapters 8 and 9, or Jesus' death and resurrection in the Passion narrative, uh, and so forth. There are many topics and ways in which to preach from Matthew, but don't forget how the structure of a book often uh, offers some topics and ways to preach it. Uh, Matthew's structure offers a theme of salvation history, how salvation has become extended to the Gentiles, for example. Um, compare Matthew 10, 5, where Jesus says to the 12 disciples, go only to the house of the lost sheep of Israel. And uh, chapter 28, 18 to 20, 20, where he says, as you go to the nations. Um, so what's going on here in Matthew's gospel is salvation history develops from being for the Jews to being for the nations. That's the kind of thing to pay attention to. If you just have one pericope in front of you, you might miss that point that is made by the structure of Matthew's gospel. Uh, the outline I've suggested highlights mission, and that is certainly something that we see with Matthew himself by ending his gospel with the Great Commission. One could also highlight the person of Jesus as well, since that is clearly something Matthew's doing. Um, so that might get us involved in looking at a specific passage, but it might also get us to look at the character of Jesus in Matthew's gospel and therefore looking at more than one passage. Is it appropriate only to preach a particular passage as opposed to something from the structure of the entire book, as we uh, explain the purposes of the of that of the author of the Word of God. Now, I've already said a word about my use of the word mission. We have to be careful about introducing words that are not in the biblical text in a way to structure things. But that interpretation I've suggested does seem to make sense. At least it's a dynamic term. Jesus, uh, there's a story to tell about Jesus, and that's what the gospel is. And what is that story? It's what he came to do. What did he come to do? Well, he proclaimed a message of the kingdom of heaven, but he also brought the kingdom of heaven. And how did he do that in his life and ministry? So as we follow through uh, the story, we have to say, well, actually, it's a missional story. Um, and, and I think the word mission does apply. Uh, we might note then, with our reference to narrative, that some interest has occurred in every field of the theological curriculum and many areas of the university as well, an interest in narrative. And so there is something that has captured some people's attention of narrative sermons and how to do that. And people mean different things by that. Sometimes it's just telling a story in your sermon or the whole sermon being a story or a made up story or something. But it, to the extent that we're going to preach the Bible, the question then might be, how do we present the narrative that is presented in the scripture in, in a sermonic context rather than teaching ideas or theology? Um, and, and so forth. So we might pay attention to, in, in looking at the Gospels, to uh, the narrative of the Gospel as it might relate to the narrative sermon that presents the story. Um, I would suggest giving some thought to that. And then since Matthew's Gospel is thematically arranged, then that does offer us a way of talking about pedagogy uh, teaching from Matthew's gospel. Uh, Matthew's topical structure makes teaching from this book very easy compared, for example, to Mark's gospel. Um, the Sermon on the Mount, the parables, the response to the kingdom of heaven, the teaching on littleness and forgiveness and so forth are all arrangements by Matthew which are tailor-made for teaching on such subjects. 
uh, in our ministries. I've often found, uh, I've often uh, seen an approach to teaching from Scripture which, which picks up a topic and runs from Genesis to Revelation without people ever getting a sense of the context of any one Scripture verse uh, thrown at people. Now, this gives a sense of deep study and truth. After all, hasn't the speaker done a lot of study all over the Bible? Uh, they picked this verse up and picked that verse up. But it is probably more an indication of shallow study, in my view, using a handy concordance to trace one or two words throughout the Bible. Such an approach, while not entirely wrong or useless, usually ignores the basic rules of exegesis of reading in context and is ripe for hermeneutical blunders, of putting things together that no author actually intended. It also fails to teach people how to read scripture. One of the things we do is not only present our understanding of scripture when we speak to a group in ministry, but we're also uh, in, uh, subtly uh, showing them how they go about reading the scripture themselves. Scripture is not a lengthy collection of memory verses, but 66 books to be read in their own right and context. That approach is rather like the person with 66 books in the history of the Second World War and a concordance which lists which uh, you might find where you might find certain words in those different books. Who would think to study these books through the concordance more than simply reading the books and discussing sections within this or that book? Or with respect to the story of the Second World War. And of course, the concordance could be helpful. Concordances are helpful, or Bible works accordance, logos programs, looking at not only words but phrases are very helpful for the study of Scripture, but more to find things than to structure a teaching around them. And so with those words, um, I would like to conclude our look at Matthew's Gospel in terms of his sources and in terms of his structuring and the application we might make of it.